All right, folks, welcome back to another episode. Today, I wanted to cover five tools that are gonna help take your guitar building to the next level. And by that, I mean, maybe you've been building guitars for a couple of years, or even just you've only built one or two, and um, you're having what you consider to be issues with um, fit and finish, uh, quality, or maybe some of your issues are just like, you know, God, I, the tool that I'm using, like, it's not readily available in my shop, so I have to like dig it out all the time so I find myself not using it. Or maybe just some different ways of approaching some of your building that are gonna help prevent you messing up. Um, so the five things that I've chosen are uh, having a quality sanding option, power sanding option that's available and ready to go at your workbench, making sure that you're using a higher quality hand plane, having a sharpening system in place that's ready to go, using a drum sander as opposed to using just your hand planes to thickness woods. And the other one that's really cool is the vacuum clamping system that will allow you to better hold the guitar body uh, and other pieces of wood during the construction process. So um, I think that the first thing we'll cover is the drum sander. And um, for me, I know that when I first started building the way that I was thicknessing my tops and my backs and my sides is like many of you guys, I was using, you know, some cheap Home Depot hand plane, not that this is one, um, and then trying to clamp this soundboard to my workbench and uh, just friggin' hogging away at it, just going to work. And uh, you constantly, inevitably, will find yourself because uh, you haven't been doing it very long and you don't have a good sharpening system that you're getting tear out um, and that it's taking forever and that you're finding that the tops and the backs and the sides aren't evenly thicknessed. Um, so then I know that what I started to do was using a, a DA sander, which would, I would use like a super coarse sandpaper and then try to hog the material away that way, which allowed me to do it like uh, better with less tear out. But once again, I was getting a very uneven surface. So for quite a few years, I really wrestled with the idea of getting a drum sander and uh, I bit the bullet, God, probably 10 years ago, and I bought a Jet, um, I think it was a 1632 um, drum sander that I found on Craigslist. And just immediately, it was one of those purchases that was like, why didn't I do this sooner? Um, uh, it was just an incredible way for me to take woods that I never before would have been able to thickness, things like um, figured koa and quilted maple, which I use a lot of that were impossible for me to use a hand plane with because it would get tear out because of all the figure. Um, and it would allow me to just run it through my drum sander and quickly and uh, thickness my sides especially, but in my backs and my tops as well. Um, it made it so that I could run those pieces um, with more control so that I could run the top through and then feel it and get a sense of whether or not it was there or not. Uh, without being distracted by just hogging out material. So um, shortly thereafter, getting that drum sander and using it for the obvious things, which was just, you know, thicknessing tops and backs and sides, was when I realized like, well, I can use this thing for just making parts as a whole. I started using it for making my own binding, which up to that point, you know, I was spending, I don't know, what is it, $5.50 or $6 a piece from Stumac for a good quality um, quilted maple piece of binding so that instead of doing that what I was able to do is just buy chunks of maple on eBay or other lumber dealers and then slice them up on my bandsaw and then run them through my drum sander and for $40 I could make 60 pieces of binding which was just a huge savings for me. That was an epiphany for me. Uh, along with that I was also able to run all my binding through it, uh, not my binding, but I was able to run all my um, brace wood through the drum sander which allowed me to make more accurate bracing patterns instead of it being all hand cut, which does have its advantages in some way, but instead of it being all hand cut and, and thicknessed, I was able to, to cut it by hand and then run it through the drum sander so that I could get very consistent bracing. And to me, that's a very important part of coming up with a consistent sound and a consistent, um, um, a consistent technique for yourself because so much of guitar building is intuitive. So, and part of gaining that intuitive sense of what works and doesn't is being consistent in the way that you do it. So, 
That is why I would recommend highly that if you're even kind of on the fence and you have the means, because they're not cheap by any means, um, to get yourself a drum sander. I personally use this Powermatic, the PM2244. Uh, it's something I purchased probably three years ago, and it is just an absolute pleasure to use. I don't ever have any issues with it. Quality drum sander, as opposed to a really cheap one, is going to um, prevent burning of the wood because it has speed controls on it to prevent it from bogging down and, and cooking the wood. Um, it'll also not use up as much sandpaper because of the same reasons that it's not bogging it down. Um, and it also has more precise controls on that, that, that PM2244. Uh, I have um, the, the, the um, depth of cut control on it is very accurate. So, um, yeah, that's just a, a quick thing that I would highly recommend for you if you find that your biggest issue is leveling the sides or just getting parts made in a accurate and controllable way. The second thing that I would really recommend you getting that doesn't have nearly as high of a uh, entry point uh, price is the... LMI vacuum clamping jig that I use pretty much daily here in the shop. I have it attached to my workbench um, and what it is is a cylindrical um, base that allows you to stick the guitar to it uh, in a non-destructive way and uh, what's required is for you to get the actual vacuum clamp system and then you have to have a vacuum pump. A lot of the times you can save a lot of money by buying the vacuum pump on eBay used you can find from the old Kodak factories, for example, they used to use vacuum pumps all the time in film processing. So I know that I got my first vacuum pump, I think, for less than $100 and uh, plumbed this thing in place. And it was another one of those just like holy cow moments for me where it took um, my guitar building to another level higher in quality. And the reason that it does that is it allows you to safely and securely stick the guitar on the clamp without you having to worry about damaging it in any way is always that that conundrum that all builders come across when they've got the guitar body closed up like I have here in the background and now you've got to do all the level sanding on the sides in preparation for cutting your binding channels and you know how do you hold that in place <laughs> inevitably what you first do is you try to wrestle this uh, guitar body with your hand while you while you sand it with your right hand and the, the, the body's moving around and it's just it's absolutely a, a, an impossible thing to win that battle in order to get your sides perfectly level so by getting this vacuum clamping system it allows you to just simply stick the guitar on there you can rotate it in any direction you want to it holds it with like 300 pounds of suction um, and then you can really get on there with a spindle sander or if you're still doing it by hand and with a scraper you can do that and have a lot of control rotate the body and then work on the area that you want to um, you can flip it so that the top is facing up or the back is facing up and do all of your sanding I know for me when I do a lot of my inlay work on the bodies um, I know it's really nice knowing that the guitar is suctioned into place and that when I really lock it down it's not going anywhere and it allows me to have a lot of control um, when I do my end graphs on the bottoms of my guitars here, um, having the ability to suction the guitar body on it upside down um, really gives me a lot of control when I'm using my chisels and making um, my miter joints with all my binding. Um, the other thing that I use that vacuum clamp for all the time is when I'm doing my neck set and cutting my um, mortise and tenon for putting the neck on the body. Once again, it's just it's incredibly important that the guitar body sits really still while you do this. So. Um, by having the clamping system in your shop, it's going to open up all kinds of doors. And a little fun thing about it too is that you, it's not just for guitars. Is I use it regularly for when I'm just doing some woodworking projects around here. But as long as it's got a flat surface to it, you know, I can suction a giant piece of you know two by twelve to this if I want to, and I and I do that on the regular. Um, for me, uh, this past month or so, I actually bought a really nice lab grade vacuum pump. And I installed it in my shed, which is out like in my backyard, and then plumbed the whole thing into the shop with a Max Airline um, plumbing so that I don't have to hear my vacuum pump at all. And now I've got the ability to have vacuum on demand. And I've also got um, pull downs in my shop for compressed air as well as vacuum air um, that run through my attic and come down and give me the ability to do that. Those are like luxury things that you don't have to do, but it um, is definitely something that 
makes my guitar building, I think, that much better, more consistent and more accurate. And um, I think the main thing with all of the things that I'm covering today are just having quality tools that do a job really well, but also are just at, at the ready at all times. That is a really big, um, that's a really big step in, in, in making a better instrument is, is knowing that you have the tool and that it's ready to go. You don't want to have to, you know, yeah, I've got the tool, but it's in that, in that, you know, that drawer over there. I just, I just got to get the job done. So I'm not going to go pull it out. I know that I'm super guilty of that. And many of you guys probably are too. So, um, having the tool and having it properly set up and, and, and a place on your workbench that's ready to go is very important as well. All right, the next thing that I have found that has been incredibly helpful for me in my guitar building quality is having a super high quality sanding option, power sanding option that's available for you at your workbench that's ready to go. Um, and for me, what it started off with was always having the, um, like a Home Depot or a Lowe's DA sander that I, I probably got. I went through one like every year, every year and a half. And uh, the last one that I had was a rigid, I have no idea what the model was. Great little sander, but you know, it had like the odd dust collection port on it and I found myself using it uh, and never hooking it up to dust collection because it didn't fit my, my full size dust collector. Um, and then when I finished with it, I would roll the cable up and I'd stick it inside of a drawer so that inevitably half the time when I needed to do a sanding job, I would just grab a piece of sandpaper off of the shelf and put it on a sanding block and do the sanding. Uh, when the reality of it is what I probably could be doing the job twice, three times, four times as quick by using a DA sander, but I didn't feel like getting the sander out. Um, so my local hardware store, I'm very lucky there's a mom and pop hardware store down the road called Frank's Cash and Carry, and they started carrying Festool, which, you know, I've always wanted some Festool tools, but uh, I hadn't really had any time to drool over them and look at them in person. So I got to thinking about using this, which is the Festool RO90DX sander. At f On face value, it looks very odd. We're used to seeing our DA sanders like this. This one seems like, well, what's the point of the weird handle? And the reason I ended up settling on this one was because of the small size um, of the head, which allows me to get it down into the nooks and crannies of a guitar, into the waist and the uh, cutaway area of a guitar. But it also has a switch at the top here, which allows me to take it and turn it into a full rotary sander, which means that it just continues to spin, almost like a, um, the buffer that you would use on a car, um, which allows me to do really great work when it comes to finish work. I can actually do what used to take me a day and a half to do all my level sanding before I would buff a guitar out. Now I can literally take the, an entire guitar from it being hung up to dry to ready to buff in less than an hour, which is huge time savings. Um, it also has a middle section on the switch, which is a, a dual action random orbital uh, sanding mode, um, which is what you typically would find on a, on a DA sander from Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, and then it has another section which allows it to just vibrate but without spinning. So with just three selects of the dial with using the same sandpaper, say you're using 120 grit sandpaper, you can cut super aggressive, medium aggressive, and then fine without even changing out the sandpaper, which is an incredible thing. This, along with the CT Sys dust collection system that Festool makes, which is their smallest um, dust collector that I have installed permanently underneath my workbench, allows me to have this thing just hung up on my pegboard and ready to go. It's already wired up. I flip a switch on it. And the moment I turn it on, it also turns on the dust collection system. And it has completely changed the way that I do my sanding operations in my shop. Um, I, I use my, my electric sander for just about every job that I can use it on now. Whereas before, like I said, I would just muddle through with hand sanding. Um, about three months ago, I went out and I bought this. This is the, um, the ETS EC150 sander. This is just the dual action random orbital larger sander um, that I got to give me a larger surface area just for sanding tops and backs as well as side projects that I do that are not guitar related. Um, I would recommend if you do the Fest tool route that you get the different heads that they make for each of these. Um, all of their sanders, they offer different um, stiffnesses of heads so you can have more of a soft one 
like the soft one is the one that I use when I'm sanding the sides of my guitars so that it'll kind of follow the contours a little bit better. And then they make very hard ones that are very stiff, which are great for when you're doing all your finishing work, allow you to be able to get perfectly smooth and level surfaces. Um, you don't have to get the Fest tool. My main thing that I'm trying to get across here is that you, that you really think about getting a quality sander that's paired up to a quality dust collector that's dedicated just to the sanding operations um, because it's just going to make it available, ready to go, and you'll use it a lot more than you would if it was, you know, the cable was wound up and it was stuck in a cabinet somewhere. So a, a very big consideration that you should take if uh, you find yourself not using the right tool for the job when it comes to sanding. The next thing that I would really recommend you getting is some sort of high quality, higher quality hand plane. This goes for chisels as well, but hand planes for me are the one thing that I did that I stepped up my, uh, my, um, my quality level and it really allowed me to make that much more accurate of a guitar. And for me, it ended up being um, my first Lee Nielsen hand plane, which actually was God, I can't remember what they call this. This is like their little apron plane. It's like $120. I got it for Christmas a few years ago, and that's when I realized like these little cheap Craftsman and Stanley planes that I was using, uh, the modern Stanley planes that I was using were just total total crap, but they were not very accurate. There's a lot of slop inside of them, you know, and you get to running these things across a, a piece of wood and, and the, the plane it, blade itself is shifted because it's got slop, and next thing you know, you get tear out. You find yourself fixing things. But earlier this year, I went out and I, I splurged and bought these Bridge City. This is the HP9 hand plane and the HP12, right? Yes, this is the HP12. And these things are just absolute Rolls Royces of hand planes. I spent more on, on this hand plane than I did on my table saw. But I use my hand plane more than I use my table saw. And so I don't mind using that money that would be normally allotted for a power tool for a hand tool because if you if you've got quality hand tools you'll find that you use them more than you do your power tools anyway and uh, by having a really high quality one it's going to hold its edge a lot lot longer which to me is like the number one reason and the secondary reason is that it is a lot more accurate whenever i go to adjust the depth of cut or if i adjust the opening of the mouth here i set it and I know that it's gonna stay. If I want to hand plane a piece of curly maple, if, I, if I'm just adjusting like the binding on the back of a guitar, I wouldn't have dared using a hand plane of my, of my cheaper quality ones because I knew for a fact that they weren't gonna plane off any wood. All they were gonna do is chip out a big old chunk of the flame. And so with these higher quality planes, I have been able to spend time learning how to do a proper sharpen job and knowing that doing so wasn't going to be a waste of my time because the edge that I created on the blade was going to last for months and months uh, other than just basic touch-ups. And I also know that whenever I set a depth on it and I dial it in, um, that when I go to run it across that piece of wood that I'm trying to cut, that it is not going to have shifted or adjusted and I can trust it. It's incredibly important that you trust the tools that you're using. Um, and these Bridge City tools for me, have really done that. Um, the Lee Nielsen ones are fantastic as well. Um, Lie Nielsen, however you want to say it. Uh, the Veritas ones are absolutely fantastic hand planes as well. There's a lot of really good options out there. Um, but the main thing is if you've so far up to this point have found yourself using just a cheap $30, $40 hand plane that you got at your big box store that you might feel frustrated and think that I'm terrible with hand planes. And the reality of it is you might not be terrible with hand planes. You might just be using a really crap hand plane. The very last thing that I would recommend that you get, probably actually out of all of the things I've shown you today, the most important thing that I would recommend that you do in your shop if you find yourself not being able to take your guitar to the next level is coming up with a reliable sharpening system that once again is readily available in your shop uh, and that is consistent that you're good at um, and for me 
that can be one of the mechanical electric sharpening systems. If you can make it work for you, that's fine. Um, if it's, uh, God, what are the other ones? If, if it's just a little hand jig with like a diamond honed on it, I know that there's little quick ones like that. Those might work for you. I, for me personally, I kind of have tried all of them. And what I've ended up settling on is doing it the old school way. That's what's worked best for me. It wasn't until I actually went out and bought these nice um, Bridge City tools that I said to myself, like, okay, everything I've tried up to this point has gotten me like a relatively sharp blade, but it hasn't gotten me that like razor sharp blade where I could cut the hairs off my arm or, you know, run it through a um, paper towel like you see on YouTube all the time where they just run it through there and it cuts through like hot butter. Um, so I figured, let me put the time in and really figure out how to do this. And like so many of the tasks that I've done in my shop, um, I got to wondering if maybe I wasn't good at sharpening by hand because it was the tools and not necessarily the skill. And um, I got to looking at um, Woodcraft's website and saw that they sold these really big pieces of granite. Um, so I went ahead and bought one of those because I knew that the biggest thing when it comes to hand sharpening is having a perfectly true and flat surface that you can, that you can do all your sharpening on. Uh, and I was up to that point using like my table saw or, you know, an edge sander, but inevitably those tools end up having things sitting on top of them. And then you just got to like move them out of the way so that you can sharpen. And that's just another barrier to sharpening. So I bought the, the big piece of granite. Um, I went out and bought a really nice honing guide from Bridge City Tools. This one is actually the HD-4 honing guide. It's absolutely incredible. Even if you don't own any other Bridge City Tools, I highly recommend this honing guide, as well as the um, HG-4 setup gauge, which is, um, I don't use all the time, but it's a fantastic gauge so that you can set your bevel angles. So I got that. I went out and bought these two sharpening diamond sharpening stones by DMT. I got the fine and the extra fine. Uh, 3M makes these super nice um, sharpening papers um, that go all the way down to 0.1 micron. Um, and then I also bought this lapping fluid. And I just kind of got to digging back again on YouTube and, and kind of just making sure that I was doing it the right way. And what I found that it ended up being that it was the tool that was uh, preventing me from being able to get those really sharp edges. So between this really dialed in piece of stone and a good honing guide, which I think are the two most important pieces, um, I was able to take my crappy <laughs> barefoot uh, brand chisels and put a rough edge on them with the diamond stones just to get them roughly there and then take them all the way down to 0.1 micron put them on the stropping cloth and just get an absolute mirror finish on them. And then I was able to take it and put it on my hand and it pulled the hair off like as if it was a razor blade from, uh, you know, from Gillette. And I was so excited because literally for, for almost 15 years, I've never been able to get that edge that I wanted. Um, so now what it is, is I spent like a day just getting all of my blades in the shop, you know, all the hand plane blades, um, all of my chisel blades, and I, I got them all dialed in so that they're perfect, which was actually a really fun day um, just to get in here and, and get your tools working better. And now that they've got a good, clean, good edge on them, um, I find that A, I take better care of them because, you know, I want to keep that edge. But B, um, they just need to be touched up, which is really nice. So now, you know, if I'm getting ready to do a job on a guitar where I need to use my chisels to get a perfect miter joint, which you guys know that that's a very common task in guitar building, um, I can actually even just freehand, I don't have to put it in the honing guide, but I can just run this chisel across the stropping cloth, which is a piece of leather, uh, and it brings that edge right back to it in two seconds. Um, putting it in the honing guide is, is better because it maintains the, the angle. Um, so now it's like I am always, always, always using incredibly sharp chisels and hand planes, which makes what are not that great of hand planes for me. I've actually put these really nice wooden handles on these barefoot blade uh, chisels. But, you know, they're not, you know, I think I paid like 120 bucks for that set of chisels a decade ago. Um, but because they have good edges on them now, they cut just incredible. I use them appropriately. Uh, I use them all the time, and I almost never get tear out 
Um, one of the biggest advantages to having sharp chisels in guitar building, I find, is in two things, is in voicing your tops and your backs, because it allows me to scalp those braces with much more accuracy. Um, I know that probably many of you have been, you know, voicing a, a, like an X-brace, scalloping an X-brace, and that thing slips off and gouges into the top of the guitar, and nothing will piss you off worse. Um, even though nobody's going to see it, it's still just, it's, you know, you're trying to build this perfect guitar and now you've got a repair on it and you're not even 10% into the build yet. Well, that slip didn't necessarily come from lack of skill. It probably a large part of it came from having a dull blade. Um, and the other thing is that it, having a sharp chisel is going to give you a lot more control when it comes to doing all your binding and your, your detail work on the guitar. You can get really good miter joints that just butt up invisibly against each other. Um... So, yeah, I highly recommend that you have a sharpening station. I'm actually going to, like I said, I'm going to build this granite block into a new workbench so that it's always ready to go. Um, yeah, and so I think that what you've probably noticed amongst the five things that I covered today is that the main theme has been having the right tool for the job and then having it available and ready to go at all times. Those are like the biggest barriers to entry I find in most tasks in making things is is mostly having it like ready to go. You don't want to have to stop that flow. I know for me that when I'm in the middle of a build, you know, your your head's down and you're doing the job and like you don't want to have to stop what you're doing to go get a tool out of a cabinet. So these things are all related in that way. Having a good sharp chisel along with a good vacuum pump is going to allow me to just stick the guitar on the vacuum pump. I've got a really sharp chisel that's ready to go and it's going to give me a quick, quick and accurate cut where I need it. Having my D, I might find, okay, now I got to do a quick touch up on that one piece. I pull out my Festool sander off the wall and I do a quick touch up on there. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm going to use my hand plane to knock a, a, a chamfer on this one edge. So like just those four tools right there, like in, in 60 seconds of time, I could use all of them. And they're all going to be like in one chorus with one another. This is like a, a symphony of instruments that have all got to play together. And the big outlier on this one is the drum sander. Having that drum sander earlier in the process when you're just getting the woods ready for use is, is the huge advantage to that one, is having repeatability, having, having wood that's um, able to be dimensioned to a repeatable process is going to uh, allow you to build guitars quicker and more accurately and more repeatably. So I hope that um, you enjoyed this short little video and we'll keep pumping these things out. I've got some really good ideas for some more videos and uh, I'm gonna try to put some links for all of the tools um, down below. If you guys like what you're watching, please comment and like and subscribe because that helps get more viewers towards us and we will try to keep this content coming towards you guys and I thank y'all for tuning in, I appreciate you.